I hope you caught that, church. There is no, no end of our Father's love for us. That is awesome. And he leaves the 99 to go pursue the one. That's what we looked at last week. Remember, we looked at the first of three rapid fire parables that Jesus told with no explanation. He just launched right into the next one. And I said we would get to the third one today. And we're here, the story that you have probably known as the prodigal son. But in the words of Neo, or is it Morpheus, one of them, what if I told you it's not what you think it is? Let me explain. The year is 1977. It's a great year. It's a great year. Raise your hand if you're alive in 1977. Okay, all right, okay, half, that's good, that's good. <laughs> Barely, right, right? May 25th, the world is buzzing because a movie is coming out. One of the greatest movies of all. In fact, let's just have a moment of silence as we remember the great. Can you guess what movie I'm talking about? Absolutely. Star Wars. It's 1977. It's not on in the theaters where I live in Titusville, Florida. So dad's got to load up all the scudders, me and my brothers. And we drove to Merritt Island, to the big town of Merritt Island, population 17. And there they had a theater. And this was the poster. Now let's just see how awake you are and how culturally adept you are. If you can name them, let's just start right here. Who's this? Good. The furry guy? Okay. The guy in the middle? All right. Upper right here? Prince Leia? Good, good. Okay. All right. Over here? Han Solo? Good. Beneath him? Okay. All right. All right. Now, this next one's going to be tough. This is going to show who's the real fan. Who is this guy in the bottom left? Grandma. Who knew that? Greetings, fellow Star Wars nerds. Okay, <laughs> That's, you have too much time on your hand as well. Grand Moff Tarkin. So, I was so pumped up. And then, imagine my exuberation when I found out that the prequels were being made. And they came out in 1999, and 2002, and 2005. And we're like, whoa, these are going to be awesome. And the buzz began to build. And I had a guy come up. He knew I was a diehard Star Wars fan. And he said, are you going to go see the new prequels? And I'm like, am I going to? I'm not going to. Yes. Am I going to go? Is the Pope Catholic? Yes, then I'm going. This is what I'm going. This is, I love the story of Luke Skywalker. I want to see how it begins and all this stuff. And he said, oh, easy trigger. What if I told you that this series isn't really about Luke? It's about Anakin. You're talking about his dad? It's about the father. And it blew my mind. This story today we're going to look at, what if I told you, even though we've called it the prodigal son for years and years and years, what if I told you that this story is actually more about the father? I am your father. What if I told you that today this is a story of a father's love who was absolutely reckless and extravagant and lavish, welcoming back a very wasteful and crazy, rebellious son? What if I told you that's what this is about? His love saying, come home. You are welcome here. You are safe here. And today the Father is telling everyone in this room and all those watching online, you are safe here. You are welcome here. God wants us all to return to the fold. Let me show you what I mean. When I was in high school, I couldn't stand grammar, like at all, like diagramming sentences. I don't even know if you do that in high school or middle school or elementary school. All right. The fact that I'm doing grammar in high school tells you how I felt about grammar, okay? And they asked me to diagram a sentence. I didn't like it. So what we're going to do is we read the scripture. And it's going to be a lot of scripture. I hope you brought your Bibles today because it is going to be jam-packed. Luke 15, verse 11, we're just going to give you a little tease here, starts with this right here. And he says, there was a man who had two sons. This is how Jesus begins his third parable. Now, if you had to diagram this sentence, who is the subject of that sentence? The man. Yes. The sons are the object. This is a story about the father who gave extravagant, recklessly wasteful love to his children. And to fully appreciate it, we're going to read the whole thing in its entirety. So go ahead and open your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. If you're reading on a digital app, I'm going to read from the CSB translation, the Christian Standard Bible today. While you pull that up, let me welcome our online campus. Great to have you with us as well. I hope God's word will speak loud and clear to you. Luke 15, we're going to start in verse 11 and we're going to read all the way through at least verse 24 to start with. Here we go. He also said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of the estate I have coming to me. What a bold statement. So he distributed the assets to them. Not many days later, 
The younger son gathered together all he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. After he had spent everything, a severe famine struck the country, and he had nothing. Then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. He longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would even give him anything. He couldn't even eat those. Verse 17, when he finally came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food? And here I am, dying of hunger. I'll get up, and I will go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired workers. So he got up, and he went to his father. But while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him, and he was filled with compassion. He ran. He threw his arms around his neck, and he kissed him. The son said to the father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told the servants, Quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger. Put sandals on his feet. And then bring out the fattened calf and slaughter it. And let's celebrate with a feast. Because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate good time. Come on. Do, do, do. Sorry, that will be in your head the rest of the day. That's not in my notes. But he began to celebrate. And I want you to see this party and how cool this is. Because when you dig down into the Bible today, you will see that this is a love story that shows what the Heavenly Father is truly like. That's why it's such a powerful parable and why so many call it their most favorite chapter of the entire Bible. Because right here, we get to see how much you are worth in God's eyes. If you ever question how God feels about you, this is your story. If you ever questioned in this vast universe, if you have any significance, this is the story for you. How does God feel about you? It's answered right here. So the story is basically told in five scenes. Scene one, we're right there on the family homestead. Probably big, it's probably wealthy. Here the younger son goes up to the dad and says, divide the property between me and my brother. I want my inheritance now. And the father evidently does. Y'all, this is so foreign to us. And at first glance, you might think, oh, all right, cool dad. <laughs> or maybe this dad does not know how to say no, or he has no boundaries. But you'd be missing the point because there is something going on here that Jesus is describing. As he tells this story, people's jaws are hitting the floor because this is scandalous. This is absolutely unheard of. You do not go early and say, Dad, I know you're still alive. I kind of wish you were dead. But can I have the inheritance now? Because that's akin to saying, why don't you just go ahead and die? It came, in the Middle Eastern countries, you would never make such a request while your father was still alive. You, would ne you wouldn't even dare. You would probably get run out. And the whole village knew this. And so he goes, he says, hey, I want my share of the state, and it is outrageous. Divide the inheritance before me, and I want you to have my share of the state, and I'm, I'm out of here. And to everyone's shock, in this story, the dad does it. He does that is unexpected. The next words, look at verse 13. He says, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, and he set off for the distant country. And there he squandered his wealth on wild living. There's a hidden gem right here. Something I caught just this week. No matter how many times I've read this, a hundred times, I have never put it together that I just assumed this guy, boom, got his inheritance and bolted for the far country. I'm a party animal. Let's go live it up. Mm, 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 mm. You hear the bass and the clubs going. Everybody's having a great time. And he bolts. But that's not what the text says. Notice it doesn't say he left immediately. He hung around a few days. He didn't bolt. He didn't leave. He says not long after that. Some translations say after many days or after a few days. Why didn't he bolt? Check this out. Because the text tells us the answer. He was given his share of the estate. He was given lands. And lands and assets are not liquid cash. You see what I'm saying? He, he still didn't have money. He had to sell this. He had to go liquid. You can't go to a foreign country and go, hey, I'm a new guy in town, and I'm exceedingly wealthy. I have no money on me. But if you take my word for it, I own some land way over there and some cattle. Drinks for everybody. Put it on my tap. That barkeep would say, no, thank you. Show me the money. 
He had none. He had, all he had was assets. He divided the estate with them. So think about what he did. This is so, here's his dilemma. He has to sell these things. He has to liquidate them. But the only problem is the only people that are there to buy them are his fellow village mates. People who know what's happened. As Jesus is telling this story, his listeners are sitting here thinking, what kind of a brash, arrogant, prideful, selfish son is this? That first says, dad, give me my share of the land. Give me my share of the cattle. Give me my share of the estate. And then he goes from door to door trying to convince the people who know his father, hey, you want to buy my stuff? <laughs> you want to buy some of my dad's land? Are you kidding me? Can you imagine? He, he comes and knocks on the door. He's like, hey, I'm going out of town. I'm going to sell some of my dad's estate. Do you mind buying some of this? It's going cheap, you know, a couple goats, maybe some gold coins, and, and it's yours. Think about what they did. These folks knew that this boy had insulted the father. They knew this was unheard of, and they had shamed this father, basically wishing him dead, and now he's doing the unthinkable of going door to door, trying to sell off these possessions. Probably they'd been in the family for generations, because in Middle Eastern times, this was your identity. Land was everything. And he's just like squandering it, like, ah, thanks, give it to me. I'm going to go liquidate it. I got to sell it. I got to get out of here. And in the Middle Eastern, this is part of your identity, and you don't do this. And I guarantee you, as the days went by, He's filled in that pressure. He's feeling more scorn and shame, and the villagers are starting to talk because I promise you gossip is nothing new. <laughs> it's not just been around with the advent of social media. They gossip back then. In fact, they didn't even have this. They had to talk to each other, which leads to even more gossip. And you know they knew this guy. I'm like, have you heard what that guy's son is doing? He asked him for his state. He's not even dead. And he's doing all this. And so finally, once he's liquidated the stuff and the transactions are completed, the son leaves town and it heads, quote, to a faraway land. And that's where scene two takes place. Scene two is in the faraway country. The wayward son goes berserk. And he is the life and he is the party and he is up there and he's making it rain and he's spending all this money and everybody loves him until, until the money runs out. Then you find out who your real friends are. And he squandered it, and it was quick. And I guarantee you, every citizen in that faraway country knew all about this young whippersnapper who blew into town like a hurricane, and now he's flat broke. And guess what? That faraway village is not very impressed with him either. Who is this obnoxious guy from out of town? Now he's totally out of money. Shocker. We're so surprised. Now in the Middle East... They're classier than we would be. And they don't come right out and say, we don't like you, go home. They're more subtle than that. So what they do is they're very polite. They come up and they assign them a job or a task that they know the person will refuse. That way they make their own decision and they leave. So they assign this Jewish boy the task of feeding swine, of feeding pigs. It's just a problem with that. Pigs are unclean. According to the law of Moses, you don't even get around them. So they said, let's give him that job. I got a great job for that guy. Hey, you could feed the pigs. Now, here's another double whammy. Not only are the pigs unclean, he has to feed them every day, which means he has to work on the Sabbath. He, this Jewish boy can't even keep the Sabbath if he accepts this job. No self-respecting Jew would accept this job. He accepts the job. He takes the job, and man, Jesus is telling the story. People are like, what is this is the most wild story ever. What is going on? This guy took it. So there he is. He takes the job, and he realizes quickly it's horrible. It doesn't even pay enough for him to buy food. So he looks at the food that he's given to the pigs, these little pods, little husks. They're terrible. And he's like, if I had enough of these, I would eat these. But the landowner doesn't even give him enough to do that. So now he collapses, and he's destitute, and he's desperate. And he's sitting there, and he finally starts thinking for the first time in his life, very clearly, he's in this dark hole of self-pity. And for the first time, he says, I might have to go home. But he knows he can't go home like he is because he's broke. This is what you do. When you go home in the Middle East, sons are supposed to provide for their fathers in the old age, not live off daddy. Not supposed to be in mom's basement playing on your Commodore 64. This is, this is supposed to be him coming home as a brilliant, awesome entrepreneur who's made a successful business. So he starts to get creative, and he says, I can't go home like that. I can't go home. I can't ask for my old room back and go live as if nothing happened and just be a son again. You know, when he moved out, they've rearranged the furniture in his old room. They've taken down the new kids on the block posters. They boxed up his He-Man toys. There's nothing there for him. Think about this. So he's thinking, what do I do? And then he says, 
I will go home as a hired servant. That I think I could do. That's probably my worth right now. And so he's thinking pretty clearly. And he thinks, you know what? If I work hard and I save as much as I can, someday, maybe someday, I will earn enough to contribute something back to my family. So he's kind of thinking, I'm just going to work through this. Here's my plan. I'm going to go home, admit I was a fool. And instead of saying, hey, will you reinstate me as the son I was? He says, just make me a servant and that'll be good enough. It's not a bad plan on paper. It's just one problem. Even if the father accepts this, even if the father says, okay, come on back, we'll accept the deal. What about the village he left? What about the village? What about the family members? What about the older brother? What about all those people who know the scorn and the shame of what he did to his family, what he did to his estate? He's still got to make it right with all that. I mean, this is crazy. This guy not only won't come home as a success, he is an abject failure. Now remember, how did the villagers feel when he left? Think they were like, woo, do good, hip, hip, hooray, party. No, no, no. They knew this guy, and what he had done was absolutely outrageous. So they were not happy. He had disgraced them all and basically wishing his father was dead, disposing of the family's estate and legacy. And then to make matters worse, he loses all of that estate money to those deplorable Gentiles, those wascally Gentiles, man. Who does that? So all the Jews are offended, and rightfully so. So he simply knows, I'm going to have to set my jaw I'm going to walk home, and I'm going to get ready and brace myself for whatever I find. Scorn, shame, <laughs> angry mobs with rocks throwing them at me. He doesn't know. So now we go to scene three. The younger son returns home, and this is where the story finally turns to the father in full force. The father is not an idiot. He has raised this son, and by experience, he knows two things right away about his boy. Given the maturity level and the character that his son has shown when he left home, you can bet the father's probably thinking he's not coming home as a success. He's not coming home with pockets loaded with cash. He's not coming home to take care of me, his dad, in my old age. He's coming home as probably a beggar. And he was right. The second thing he knows is that the village is probably not going to treat him very well. He knows that everybody has talked. Since his departure, I promise you, the townspeople are well aware of what has happened. This has been a, like a soap opera, and they pulled up a big tub of popcorn. And they're just like, what is it? What's he done? He's in a faraway, he's spending his money? With, what? What's he done? Wow. And then the whispers, man. As soon as that guy spotted on the edge of town, you know that flu. Can you believe these people? They're like, man, Johnny Lowlife's back in town. Here he comes. Yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. Let's get a welcoming party together. Let's meet him on the edge of town. Let's, let's do this. You know, even if the dad's looking for him, we're gonna, we can be looking for him too. We're going to let him know how selfish and arrogant. In fact, let's go tell the dad what a fool he's been. Why did he even do this? Do you see the scorn? Do you see how quickly the gossip would go and how that whole village would be aware of this? So he comes and the dad does something in scene three that is nothing short of breathtaking when you really grasp what he does. In the Middle Eastern society, you don't do what he's about to do. He does five things in rapid succession. Boom, boom, boom. And all five of these things are designed to protect and restore the son that he loves so much. Get your Kleenex ready. Because this is where it gets so real. The dad does the first crazy thing. He runs to him. He sees him coming and he runs. Y'all, you got to understand that this is outrageous. The kid is coming, and he thinks he's going to have to run this gauntlet. Maybe the villagers are seeing. Maybe there's a crowd coming. He doesn't wait for the son to run the gauntlet. The dad runs the gauntlet for him. The father says, uh-uh, I will escort you. I am going out to you. And he goes, and he runs. And it is outrageous because wealthy, respected noblemen never. They have these big robes, and they, don't, they can't run, and they shouldn't run. And if they do, they have to hike up their robes and tuck it in their girdles and go prancing through, and it is so undignified. You're not supposed to expose your ankles, much less your legs. That's the equivalent of us going around in a Speedo today. You don't do that. Man, I hope you don't do that. Can you imagine? If I saw Milo coming, I'm like, y'all hang on a sec. And I get my speed, and I go, think about this. It is outrageous, and the man thinks nothing of it. He undignifies himself. Let's put it in context. One Jewish writer says this about running. He says, a man's manner of walking tells you what he is. It's Ben Sirach. 
Fast forward to a modern day scholar. She writes this, it is so very undignified in Eastern eyes for an elderly man to run. Even Aristotle, the great German, a Greek philosopher says, great men never run in public. They don't do it. And he does, this father does. And in verse 20, we see the reason why he does. It says he saw him and he was filled with compassion. He saw his son and immediately he's like, my boy, he's back. First off, my boy's alive and he's filled with compassion. And church, hear me. That's how our heavenly father feels about us. That's the love he has for us. Every one of us, he looks and he says, that is my child. And the father deliberately runs through the village knowing he's creating a spectacle, knowing they're laughing at him in his speedo. He knows what he's doing is attracting a crowd. And he knows, furthermore, they're going to be talking about this humiliation in this village for the rest of his life. <laughs> at every dinner party, <clears throat> you remember when old man Jebediah hiked up his robe and ran? Can you imagine? The father doesn't care. He humiliates himself willingly. Now imagine just for a minute what this is like from the son's perspective. The son, man, he's, he's thinking, there's no way to get to the father's house but to go straight there. Whether that's through the village or through villagers or whatever, he doesn't know what's going to await him. He just knows for him to be a servant, he has got to go to his father. And he's got to get through this crowd. And he is ready and prepared for the worst, most humiliating moments of his life. And as he comes to the edge of the village, you know he's played it out. I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this. And if the people are there and they're taunting me and they're calling out insults and stuff, you know what? I deserve that. I, I did do all these things. Maybe they're throwing rocks at me. And he looks up. And instead of seeing the angry crowds pelting him with stones, he sees a, an elderly man dressed like Cousin Eddie coming towards him with his robes hiked up and the bare exposed legs coming and he realized, that's my dad. What is he doing? And he comes and before the kid could even get his speech out of his mouth, he wraps him in a giant bear hug. He embraces him. The second thing he does right then and there is it says he kisses him. He ran to him, threw his arms around him and began to kiss him, Luke 15, 20. And this isn't just like a welcome. <laughs> See, when we study all the Greek words about love, we talk about eros, and we talk about phylos, and we talk about agape, and there's actually a few more than that. But in this one, usually we think the brotherly love and the brotherly kiss is from the word phylos, or phileo. It means to kiss. Like, hey, what's up, bro? That's not the word used here. The word used here is kataphileo. It is a full, modified, and amped up verb that is so intense. It says he is to be kissed with a great deal of emotion with each kiss, as in to be showered with kisses from head to toe, and you don't stop. His son comes, mm -hmm, son, son, son. Now, now listen, we don't get that because we don't do that much. So what I'm going to do is I want to demonstrate this. I'm going to ask Elliot to come up, and he's going to be my, my son. And I'm going to kiss him for 20 minutes just head to toe. Thank you for not getting up, by the way. <laughs> Can you imagine? Now let that play out. What does that look like in your, not Elliot and me, but the son and the father? <laughs> I picture that and I think, imagine the welcome that felt to that boy who was braced for that and he gets Imagine the impact of that boy who's sitting here. Can you imagine the tears that flowed with each hug and kiss? Dad, I've got something to say. No, there's no time for that. I'm so glad to have you. And he's shaking, and they're probably just weeping together. It's such a beautiful, powerful picture. Picture yourself. Remember, if you've ever wronged somebody, and you know what you're going to say, and you know you're going to have to own up to it, and you're going to go, and you're going to admit, and you're going to probably grovel, and you've got some commitments and promises that you probably mean, and you go to approach that person, you've got your whole speech planned out, and then they don't even let you begin. They say, shh, shh, shh. shh all is forgiven. Bring it in. And they hug you. That's how that felt. And don't forget, this guy had his speech planned. It's a very interesting speech. Look at it with me here in verse 19. He says, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven, I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of our hired men, okay? Don't forget that. Because that's what he had rehearsed, and that's what he's thinking the whole time he's traveling back home. Now let's look at what he actually said when he arrived. He says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. 
What happened? Do you see the difference? Something's missing. Something is missing. Did you catch what's... Something is missing from his speech that he had ready and he was going. His request to become a servant. It's not there. Why? Because the Father's love overwhelmed him and said, there's no time for that. Just come here. I am going to overwhelm you with reckless, extravagant, lavish love. Son, come into my arms. His original plan, remember, was to kind of come back and earn and work his way back to his father's favor. But now his father's loving him. How could he not accept this incredible love? And guess what? The dad's not done. The third thing the dad does is he calls for a robe to be put on his son. He says, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Now, here's a question for you. Who owns the best robes in the family? Yeah, the father, the patriarch. We're talking gold emblazoned and embroidered and huge, shiny, wonderful things that just look awesome. And he says, go get that and bring it out here. We want this guy to walk the streets with this robe. People are, you know people have gathered. They're seeing this. The whispers have gone out. And the father, don't miss this. He wants everyone to know, I have accepted my son back. He is part of the family. And he wants the whole village to know this. Don't miss this. And he's not done. Look what he says next, verse 22. He says, go get a ring for his feet, or his hands, and sandals for his feet. And this is the signet ring. It's the one that has the family crest. It's the one that they would put in wax and say, this is my seal. I stand by this. You are a legitimate part of my family. You have all the rights. You have all the power. You have all the financial authority. You are, by all rights, part of this family. Go get that and put it on him. And then he says, go get him sandals. That's a sign that he is a free man. He's not a servant. Servants don't get shoes. Servants go barefoot. And finally, the father says, go bring the fatted calf and kill it. Not the fatted goat, not the fatted chicken, not the fatted squirrel. Bring the fatted calf, the big daddy. And he goes, bring it out because you know why? You remember this? He wants the whole village to share in this joy. We talked about this two weeks ago. Only a calf can feed 50, 60, 75 people. And he said, do it. It's worth it. I want everybody to know my son is back and we are restoring this. I want everyone, not just my son to be reconciled to me, I want him reconciled to the whole village. Everyone should have a relationship with the son. Does that sound eerily familiar? Do you see where this is going? Man, Jesus is weaving this incredibly complex story and we read it like it's a kid's tale. And there is so much gold in this. Jesus is saying to every person, Whoever wanted to take a step towards God, just how significant they are. And then the Pharisees don't want to hear this. They want you to earn this. God, Jesus said, it's not about that. You can't earn it. Here's the beautiful truth grenade for you. Our Father doesn't just sit around and wait for us. He runs to us. The Father, he doesn't wait for us. He runs to us. He doesn't let us bear our shame. He bears it for us. He kisses us. He puts the robe on us. He puts the ring on our fingers, sandals on our feet. He kills the big calf and celebrates with us. And he wants everybody to celebrate us with him. So scene four enters the older son. Whoo! The older son who hasn't left home, who's kind of played by the rules, but if you read this story carefully, you will soon see that this older son has also left the father. Now, he didn't leave him with his feet, but he left him right here, and he left him right here, and he gives us two hints as to why and how we know that. This is so incredible. So, remember, the father, he's divided the fields, he's divided the lands between two of them. The older son gets twice what the younger one. He gets a double portion. So the younger one gets a third of everything. This older one has gotten two-thirds of the estate. Okay? So he is, he is loaded. The property has been divided. The older son now owns everything. Him and his father are currently still working it. They're living together. Everything belongs to him. The older son comes in from the fields, and he begins to hear the music playing. And he gets the reports from the servants that his brothers come home. He comes in. He gets closer. He hears the bass. Mm, 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 mm. He's like, I love that song. Wait, what am I hearing? Is that the Backstreet Boys? Backstreet Boys. Oh, back. And he's like, oh, man, this is one of my favorite songs. And the servant says, dude, your brother has come home. They're killing the big cow. We're going to eat you. You can smell it roasting. And this brother is so excited to have his brother back. He runs in, and he kicks the door open. He says, where's my baby brother? And he throws his arms around his baby brother, and he goes to kiss. No. He doesn't do any of that. In fact, he does just the opposite. He's angry. 
Look with me at the scripture. This is unbelievable. He says, then he became angry. And he didn't even want to go into the party. So his father came out and pleaded with him. But he replied to his father, look, I have been slaving many years for you. I have never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me so much as a goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes, I love that. Not, not when my brother comes home, but when, when this son of yours, he's your son. <laughs> I'm not even related to this guy. I don't even know who you are anymore. When this son of yours comes home, who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you know what? We don't know that. Nowhere in the earlier text does it say he surrendered and gave it up to prostitutes. It says he was wild living and he was... That's more anger from the older brother going, he, he, how would he know? He's not texting on Facebook, oh, hanging out with a prostitute tonight. Woohoo! LOL, giggle. He's, he, none of that. How does he know? He's insinuating. It, it's possible and maybe even likely. But again, think where this, where this younger and the older son's relationship is. You slaughtered the fatted calf for him. What are you doing? And he refuses to join the party. Y'all, we don't get this. This is a severe insult to the dad. This is another severe insult, another slap again. Remember, the older son's role at a party is to be the one at the front door welcoming the guests. Hey, how you doing? Good to see you. Hi, hi, how you doing? Welcome, good to see you. Okay, all right. There's nobody at the door. The older son's job is to say, come on in. Have you met the patriarch? Have you helped yourself to the cow or whatever? He's not there. I promise you the entire village is aware of this. They know this. They're very aware of this, and they're thinking, so, they're, they're, the gossip has to be going again. Where's the son? Where's the older son? Hmm? What? Mm-hmm, there's trouble in this household again. Mm, wait till Martha hears about this, you know? <laughs> they're over there at the punch bowl. Think about this. Put it in modern-day terms so you grasp this, and don't gloss over this like it's some ancient, dusty story. This is God's Word, and there's so much going on here. Now, so the father is dealing with the, the older son now, and he says, all right, I'm going to go out to him. I'm going to go do this, even though he's humiliated me and he's left the party, which is for him and his son and for me. And he goes and he says this to the father. All these years I've been slaving for you and I've never disobeyed your orders. You never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. <clears throat> these are the two statements that tip us off how much distance there is between the older son too and the father. Notice what he says. He says, I have been slaving for you. He's, he doesn't think of himself as a son. He's like, man, I'm a servant. That's the very thing that the younger son hoped he could be at best. Don't miss that. He's like, if I could just go home and be a servant. And this guy's saying, I'm nothing but a servant. Are you seeing what's going on here in such dynamic? The second thing he says is he's mad and he's pouting because I never got a party with my friends. You never gave me a fatted squirrel. You never gave me nothing. And I, here I am and I hear the music and they're playing my favorite songs and you didn't ask me. You're borrowing my CDs again without talking to me and all this stuff. So what happens to the older son and the younger son. Think about this. Remember, the older son got everything. He got his inheritance too. So the father says this. Look at this next verse, verse 31. He says, my son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. He said, I already gave it to you. All these years, it's been yours. You have it all. And the older son, he's so distanced from himself, he refuses to join the father at the party. So what does the older son have to do? The father does the same thing he did for the younger son. He humiliates himself. He lowers himself and comes out to the older son. He humiliates himself by leaving the party, going out and finding his son. And when he does, oh, 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 oh he says the most beautiful, profound statement. He says this. He says, son, we had to celebrate. We had to rejoice because this brother of yours was dead. And he's alive again. He was lost. And now he's found. Wow. So what happens next? Well, to find that out, you have to read verse 33. I'll give you a minute to find it. There isn't a verse 33. Surprise! <laughs> or a verse 34? Or a verse 35? This story is literally the ultimate cliffhanger. <laughs> minus Sylvester Stallone, minus the nonstop action and avalanche of thrills, we don't get to find out that he makes it. 
We don't get anything. There is a total lack of ending and resolution to this story. And it drives them nuts. It drives me nuts. It'd be like if I came and I said, guys, we're going to do some vocal exercises. Is this on? All right. We're going to sing Do, Re, Mi. Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, La, Ti. And we never get to the Do. And that just grates on it, right? There's an unfinished part. Something is missing from this story. What does the older son do? And that is where Jesus is heading. It has all been headed to this moment. Jesus is posing a question to the Pharisees. He's talked about the lost sheep, talked about the lost coins, and now he's talking about the lost son. A hundred, then ten, and then two. He's reducing the proportions and he's drawing it to this part. Here's his audience. In their eyes, the people listening to the story, the Pharisees, they're the older sons. See, they're the ones that stayed when the other guy left. They're the ones who stayed and tried to obey and, did a, and served God like slaves and servants. And See, in their hearts, man, they're far from the Father. It's so amazing, and it's right in front of them, and I don't think they get it. They don't want to come into the party and celebrate the return of a wayward son. They don't like this guy. The Pharisees don't even like Jesus. He's ruining the name of a rabbi. He's hanging out with these despicable people. These sinners, what is he doing? And the father comes and he says, I have outrageously big arms and I am going to welcome everyone who wants to come home. And it is extravagant love. See, the older son, he's far off too, but he's proud. And he knows, I haven't been all that bad. He's mad at the father. He refused to come in. And the father comes out and he humiliates himself just as much as the younger son. Do we get that? He talks about rejoicing. And he says, come in. So based on what you read here, what do you think? Does the older son go in? Do you come in? I'm going to have my instrumentalists come up, and I want to show, show you a story here as they come and just get in place. This is what the whole thing's been driving to. The father loves his children so much, he's willing to be suffering. He's willing to be humiliated. He's willing to debase himself in order to bring us home. That's how much he loves us. Anyone ever heard of Ernest Hemingway? The great famous writer. He wrote, he wrote a book in Capital of the World, and there's this great story about a father who has a son, and they live in Spain. And the father and son are going like this, and they're not getting along. And this son gets rebellious, and he gets angry, and they start fighting, and they start having all kinds of issues. And the father finally, in his anger and his bitterness, says, get out. And he kicks his son out of the home, and he's mad, and he's stewing in that. And this goes on for weeks and months, even years. And then finally, the dad loses touch altogether, and he can't find his son. His son's name is Paco. And he says, you know what? I think I've made a mistake. And he begins to think about this. And as he gets older, he realizes all these years have gone by, and oh my goodness, what a mistake I have made by getting rid of my son in anger. So he begins to talk to his friends and says, where is Paco? I need to make things right. Will you tell him everything's forgiven? He says, oh, we haven't seen him. I don't know where Paco is. We haven't seen him in years. And he begins to search wider and wider. He can't find him in Spain. He can't find any trace of him. And finally, in desperation, before he gives up, he says, I'm going to go to the capital. I'm going to go to Madrid. And I'm going to place an ad in the paper that reads this right here. Paco, all is forgiven. Meet me at the newspaper office at 9 a.m. tomorrow. Love, your father. You have to understand something. Paco is a rather common name in Spain. And the next morning when that father arrived at the newspaper, he was stunned to find over 600 men, all named Paco, seeking the forgiveness of their father. That's how common this was. 600 people fit this description and said, what, my dad's going to forgive me? Seeking the forgiveness of the Father. Y'all, our Heavenly Father is saying the same thing. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you've made a mess of your life. Come home. Don't let the years pass. Make it right. The Father's had, He hadn't moved. <laughs> if we feel distant from the Father, guess who moved? So our Heavenly Father is opening his arms, <laughs> and he wants to give you the ring of his family. He wants to give you his name and put a robe on you. Say, you're part of the family. I sent my son to die on a cross, who was innocent, by the way, 
so that that sacrifice would take our sin, we'll hurl it on this, and that will make it right. Will you accept that? Will you come home? Let's pray about it. Let's just bow together. Lord, in the quiet of this moment, I thank you for your, your spirit and for your truth and your word today. I thank you for the picture that you've painted, that you are open-armed, and you're wanting us to come home, every one of us. Lord, I thank you for the day that it just rocked my world where I realized the depth of my sin and my depravity. And you forgave me, <laughs> a long-haired, heavy metal, nasty singing guy, and you let me back into your family, and I thank you for that. God, I pray for those here today that need a touch from you. I pray that you would just meet them in their need in this moment. Lord, for those who don't know you as Savior, God, I pray that they would just confess, you are Lord, you are who you say you are, and we need you. Lord, help us to repent of our sin, to agree with you on it, to walk 180 degrees away from our sin and toward you, where we find peace and joy and purpose and significance. Thank you for this sweet time. In Jesus' name, amen.